Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a great quick break here and we're, we're moving right along with the program. Lots of exciting stuff to come this uh, later this morning. Um, I'm actually really excited before we dive into the fireside chat to share our third case study video with you. And this one's special because it is actually the first ever reach uh, case study coming out of the University of Oxford. It explores policy recommendations for women's policing. Welcome back and we have a great session for you on data and technology for social good. My name is Arturo Franco. I'm a senior vice president at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Recent history shows that when the power of science and technology is brought to bear on some of society's greatest challenges, millions of lives can be improved. It's the case of the last century where science played a central role in transforming medicine and agriculture. And new technologies from the treatment of hookworm to the green revolution to the polio vaccine made their way to the poorest of the poor, the hardest to reach. As we look ahead, data science, the process of using advanced analytics and computational capacity to extract valuable insights from large amounts of complex data shows great promise to revolutionize everything from how we treat disease to how we provide social benefits more effectively to how we build more resilient and equitable communities. The bad news is that the many great advances in data science and machine learning over the last decades, stemming mostly from universities and the private sector, have not made their way into the hands of those working in the front lines of social progress, NGOs, multilaterals, and civic sector organizations. The good news is that help is on the way. And today I have the privilege to introduce someone who is working very hard to change this. Uh, Daniel Mikhailov is the executive director of data.org, an anthropologist with a PhD in sociology and more than two decades of experience in the co convergence between technology and social impact. Daniel, welcome to the REACH Symposium. Thank you so much. It is great to be here, Arturo. Well, let's let's kick it off. We don't have a lot of time and we want to get uh, questions from the audience for you. Um, I'm, I have uh, in this notion that becoming more data driven frontline organizations can make their work uh, go further or go faster or ultimately help more people. 
Uh, I'd like you to start with what data.org is, what is it trying to achieve in this space, um, and how are you working on this issue? Thank you. Um, so data.org um, is a platform for partnerships um, to build the field of data science for social impact. We were created uh, just over two years ago by the Rockefeller Foundation and MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth uh, as an answer to a problem they saw, which, which you just outlined in your introduction, that the social impact space is falling behind in its ability to use data science. So, my, so the whole mission of, of, of my organization is to try and help fundamentally by uh, using a platform, by connecting people together, by using multiple tools from funding projects to uh, helping uh, build capacity, to, tell, to telling stories or, of um, great examples of success in, uh, in the space. So um, that, that, that very much is, is, is the mission. Um, and there is, there is a lot of work for us. Um, Daniel, let, let me take you back before you joined data.org. Um, you founded and directed the Welcome Data Labs, uh, part of the Welcome Trust, a, a big foundation focuses on health um, around the world based in the UK. But you coordinated uh, the data science piece of their COVID-19 response. Uh, many people have said that before therapeutics or vaccines or even government lockdowns, data was our first line of defense uh, during the pandemic. We used it for all kinds of uh, things, including keeping us safe. So tell us uh, about your experience at the time. Uh, what role did you see data and data science playing uh, during the pandemic and what can we learn uh, for the rest of the world of, of development? So well, the, when, when the pandemic hit, as you said, I was I was working in the Welcome Trust, and Welcome, uh, for those who don't know them, are a large um, global philanthropy, um, the second biggest one, uh, which which focuses on funding science uh, and health specifically. So um, in the, in those early days when we were hearing that that a new virus was being identified in Wuhan, China, I remember um, everyone uh, trying to think how can we help, what what can we do rapidly and obviously my, my work as leading the data work um, allowed me to reach out to partners in the field, um, uh, other foundations like the Gates Foundation, for example, um, in order to see how can, how can we uh, contribute to the effort. One of the biggest problems at the time was we realized that data was crucial, as you said, but data was not, not often not available, often not in the right place. Uh, locked in silos, uh, the infrastructure wasn't connected very well. One of the main problems I remember in the early days when we were talking about cl clinical trials for um, new antiviral drugs and vaccines uh, is that the traditional um, academic process uh, meant that data would normally not be available for a couple of years after clinical trial because first uh, the data was collected, then it was uh, prepared for publication in, in a peer-reviewed journal, etc, etc, etc. Two years was way too long in a pandemic. So we uh, worked together with many partners um, in order to crunch that down to, to literally weeks rather than years. And uh, without getting too technical, the, the way we did it was we looked at where the data was being held in the big data repositories and we tried to make sure those repositories were interconnecting, uh, interconnected, so actually sharing data with each other faster um, and that the clinical trialists themselves were making their data available before publication, which was a big cultural shift for them. So there was both technical work and, and, and if you like, behavioral work to persuade people to share results early. And Anil, I think this uh, exercise of compressing eight years of, of what would usually take to develop a vaccine in, I think it was nine or ten uh, months will will probably go down in history as a as a great achievement of science and technology. Um, I think part of it is um, a data story. Part of it also has to do with the fact that the disease was so prevalent that you had a lot of a big sample size to to do the the research quicker, um, which was not the case in uh, previous uh, diseases. Um, but I think that we can draw a lot of parallels to other 
uh, development problems, other global challenges like climate change or financial inclusion, where uh, there is a kind of siloed uh, environment and where kind of sharing insights, uh, creating these platforms could uh, advance things very quickly. This, this brings me to one of the um, most exciting projects that you've recently launched at data.org which is called the Epiverse. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, you will tell me, it. I think it's a play on the words epidemiology and universe, which sounds a little bit like a, out of a Marvel movie. Uh, how uh, can the world improve how we use data and how uh, does the Epiverse uh, help us prevent future pandemics? So Epiverse is, is um, an example where we can that, that we can definitely learn from for other sectors. And, and the example there was we were able to bring it together fast because the work started before the pandemic. So, the, so one of the key lessons is you need to put the foundations in ahead of a crisis, which applies you know, universally, uh, not just in, in health. So Epiverse fundamentally is a, is a global collaborative. So we brought together multiple players from many philanthropies and funders, to government agencies, academics, technology companies, behind the idea that instead of every team, health team and academic team around the world who is doing epidemiology, uh, building their own tools to do it, to help themselves analyze data, it is far better to step back and fund centrally delivered open and free software. Um, because that is better in terms of its supportability, it, the reprodu reproducibility of the results, the accuracy. So um, in, in, in many aspects, an improvement. And one of the other things Epios is doing is it is not just focusing on funding the software itself, but also on, uh, on creating a community of contributors around it. And that aspect is, is as important as, as the technology tools. So it has that human lens on, on the problem because without the community effort, you're always subject to the problem of a funder exits, uh, an academic team uh, looks to do something else, and then projects, software projects can fall over. By building a broad support base, an open source community, which is active and dynamic, you make sure it's sustainability for the future. Great, uh, a quick segue to that question. Uh, after uh, pandemic prevention, what would be other areas or themes in which you would see a similar platform being built in, in the future? So the lessons of Epiverse, I, I think, really are applicable uh, universally. So a, a few things I can draw, draw out. One is um, the, the community building element for longer term sustainability. One is about leveraging funding up front, so you have multiple sources of funding. Um, another third key element is building in, in, in across the world and building capacity in low and middle income countries, for example, rather than just making sure that all the innovation is happening in San Francisco, Boston or New York. Those, those lessons are translatable. And some of the areas we are looking to in the future are, for example, financial inclusion. So we're working, uh, working out what, what are the opportunities in the financial data space to, uh, to use the same approach. What, what may be a problem that is universal, that can, uh, can be solved by taking a step back and trying to create tools that are then openly available to, to the whole sector um, internationally. Um, uh, climate, you mentioned in your introduction, is, is definitely another space. Like the pandemic, it's, it's a huge problem for globally for the planet. And like the pandemic, in order to solve it, we need to act now, not wait for the crisis to happen. Um, that uh, is is really interesting. It takes me to a question about scaling uh, these these technologies. Um, you know, there is a big kind of myth of what a data scientist can and can't do when brought to an organization. There's a lot of mistrust uh, when anyone talks about anything that has to do with data. Uh, one of the Reach Alliance case studies this year actually focused on uh, Tanzania's medical supply chain. Um, and found, among other things, that one of the main issues for effectively getting essential, potentially life-saving uh, medicines and medical supplies to people who needed them the most was actually technology. Um, the things that private organizations take for granted, like mapping tools, uh, route optimization algorithms. Um, and I feel like uh, we've seen hundreds of these 
kind of projects around the world where a data scientist helps an individual organization solve a data problem. We've we've done that with uh, my. Early see these kind of solutions reaching scale. And so what are the constraints uh, for for that to happen? What is data.org doing to accelerate the adoption of these kinds of tools and methods? So um, I, I would pick out maybe three key areas of constraints um, for scale. What, one is the uh, availability and homogeneity of data. So, so data needs to be available. And, and, and as the case in the pandemic, um, I'm sure the same is true in many other sectors. Data is either not there or it is fragmented and siloed or it is locked behind, uh, for good privacy reasons, behind uh, firewalls, and there is currently no way to access it. It's a big, big hindrance to scale of these pro uh, programs. Second one I would reach, I would uh, look to is uh, availability of talent and the and, and the skill skill sets available in social impact organizations. The work that it has done over the past couple of years shows um, they would love to apply data. They would love to hired data scientists, but they A, are competing in a marketplace against the likes of Google, Facebook. They, they cannot afford the salaries uh, being paid, so they can't, they find it very difficult to draw talent in. And even where they have talent, um, often it is isolated. So a single data scientist working in, in, in a social impact organization often is lacking support, career progression, and the kind of um, uh, levers of influence they need to really make their work instrumental for the achievement of the mission of that organization. So I would, I would I would definitely say talent, I would definitely say data and its availability. The third element is trust. And I think the, the um, Tanzania case study is, is a perfect example of that. So there is a, a lot that data science can do to scale and solve problems. But if data science is applied uh, incorrectly without, for example, understanding the subject matter properly without involving local communities. If it is parachuted in from, you know, an app is being designed in, in, in San Francisco, being delivered in Tanzania, is unlikely to work. Um, so those problems of trust um, are, are structurally in place. So, so in the Tanzania case study you mentioned, I, I was really interested in how they brought out the idea of local adaptability as, as, as key to success of these efforts, because for example, they're trying to improve the supply chain in that case study for delivery of medicines. But of course, if you rely on software being created in uh, the global north, often that's created for the urban environment. Um, in Tanzania, you have to look across both urban and rural. You have to take into account seasonality. For example, roads may not work as well in, uh, in different seasons due, due, due to weather patterns. So designing software to be effective in that environment needs to happen on the ground. So what we actually need to do is build capacity there on the ground, build a local economy and great data science talent being trained, developing their own tools and co-designing it with the community close to the problem. So that it's not only more equitable, it's also more effective. So you design better software that way. I'm going to touch on the uh, talent issue um, a little bit later because I know that there's uh, probably a, a bunch of students that have data science skills that have a passion for this kind of work that are figuring out their next steps and I want you to uh, give them some some advice on how they can connect to this work but I, I think what you just said was really interesting if you cannot uh, take the app from Silicon Valley to Tanzania you need to bring the capacity the local capacity of data science um, uh, to Tanzania. You've just launched a project called Capacity Accelerator Network. Um, tell us about what the aspiration is there and are we going to see capacity being built in the Global South? Uh, it, 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 that's exactly the intention. So it is starting off from that insight and that philosophy that we need to, to build local capacity to build good software, to build tools that work for the communities. Um, so what the Capacity Accelerator Network is trying to do is um, it is um, both looking at supply and the demand uh, in, in the capacity space. So on the supply side, we, we're going to be working with local universities to uh, fund new master's uh, 
courses in data science, but taught in a different way. So we are working with uh, on the ground with those universities and other partners to design a new curriculum for more interdisciplinary understanding of data science. So, so for example, not just training people in purely technical skills, whether it's Python coding, uh, statistics, et cetera, but also giving them uh, softer, more social skills. How do you work with communities? How do you think of longer term consequences uh, of your software when, when, when it's uh, being used on the ground? So those kind of skills which come from the humanities and the social sciences are important for producing tools which are fundamentally working correctly for communities and earn their trust. Um, so that's the supply side, um, funding those uh, courses and hopefully having an um, a inflow of, uh, of bright new talent to the sector. On the demand side, often the problem is that social impact organizations or indeed public, public sector organizations um, are not able to even absorb that talent if it is available. So the second part of Capacity Accelerator Network is within those same geographies, we'll be funding fellowships within social impact organizations and public sector organizations to take students once they graduate. We'll also be providing extra funding for organizations to improve other as aspects of their data maturity. For example, uh, building up their uh, data stacks to make sure they have the right tools for those uh, individuals to work with. Uh, improving their leadership, so working with the leaders of those organizations to make them more data literate, so they're asking the right questions in the first place. So that approach uh, of looking at supply side, looking at demand side uh, to build capacity on the ground is very important to us. Great. We have questions that are stacking up. Thank you for the audience uh, asking questions. I uh, wanted to say that a data scientist uh, being trained to understand social challenges and how to work with communities sounds a lot like one of our REACH uh, students, so maybe there could be a potential partnership in the future uh, to take the REACH uh, way, the REACH curriculum into Absolutely. capacity accelerator networks. Um, there's a question that reminds me of this big challenge that we worked on uh, last year. We put out an inclusive recovery challenge asking NGOs around the world if they had a data related problem uh, that in, 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 in trying to support the inclusive recovery uh, that they could apply. We had 1,256 applications from around the world, uh, eight winners. At the at the end, I believe uh, the question from the audience is: What are the um, kind of like what are the, the positive um, effects or that that NGOs get when they have more data science capacity? Uh, what what can you learn from the challenge um, and the work that you've done uh, to answer this question? So um, first of all. A lot of the um, organizations working in the social impact sector, and that that is true in health and climate, in in, in development, have um, access to amazing data, and that is kind of an untapped capital for them. Now, what they don't have often are the tools to realize that data to to make um, decisions from it that support their mission. Um, so, part of the work there is to improve the data maturity of those organizations in different aspects, in as aspects of leadership, in aspects of technology, in aspects of talent, so they can make better use of their data. But the data itself is, is, is hugely valuable. Um, and if we unblock those kind of blockers structurally in those organizations, then, then the, the vision is that they can reach their mission uh, faster, more effectively. Fundamentally, technology and data allows you to scale almost frictionlessly if it's done in the right way. And as, as we all know, uh, the, the whole topic of this conversation is, is SDGs. In some case, cases, we're way behind track on meeting the SDGs. Uh, we need some sort of um, uh, accel accelerant in the system. And data and technology can be that, but only if done right, if done in a trusted way. Daniel, a second question uh, is, I, I guess going back to the conversation about uh, the pandemic experience, uh, investing, as you said, at the right time, uh, not when you have the problem in your face, but before that, how do you incentivize these kinds of investments for uh, future uncertain, unpredictable events that may actually 
never happen. We we're talking about things that are happening like climate change, but is there an epiverse for for bigger problems that are uh, more long long term? Well, what, one insight from the health experience um, is that there were people who were warning that this was going to happen. So it wasn't entirely unforeseen. But when we talk about it, it being unforeseen, it's often it hasn't hit kind of public consciousness or the consciousness of, of policymakers. But scientists have been saying for years that many of the changes in our environment uh, make new pandemics more likely. So I guess the first part of the answer is we need to listen to the experts when they are saying certain changes are increasing risks. That is the point at which uh, those in power and those with funding need to support um, support them. So, so philanthropies, governments um, and funders coming in and when the experts are indicating there's a problem potentially brewing, beginning to unlock capital for investment uh, in that space. So kind of expert-led -led investment uh, upfront to de-risk something. And it applies for pandemic, it applies for um, financial inclusion, it applies for climate. It is far cheaper for us as a global community to begin to put in place um, platforms, data sets, capacity upfront than it is trying to deal with a crisis when it's fully blown. Completely, completely agree. Um, I'm going to end with a question, uh, as I said, going back to those I guess reach uh, students or uh, just young younger uh, generations that are listening. We are investing in 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 future uh, sustainable development leadership here. What would you tell them? Whether they are data literate, proficient, uh, you know, amazing data scientists or not, what would you say their approach to data science, machine learning, all of these kind of new technological paradigms should be and uh, and where can they get resources to you know to understand what the potential of of these tools could be for their future uh, work and their careers so i guess my advice would be and this is coming from my experience you don't need to be a data scientist uh, in order to make better use of data i'm not a data scientist i, I am a computer scientist and a social scientist um, so data um, is is a new discipline, and I think we've taken a far too narrow view of it so far as a tech, as a technical discipline only. But actually, we need great social scientists to understand the impacts of data. We need great economists. We need we need people of multiple disciplines, all working in the data space to make data to unlock the, the, the inherent value in data. So I would encourage encourage those young people not to be put off by thinking that data is only for mathematicians or software developers. It isn't. Um, people like me, people who are in the social scientists can make a real difference. And in terms of where to go for resources, well, come to data.org is the first place. So one, one of the uh, um, ambitions we have is to make data.org the place online, the home online for data science for social impact. So we are releasing lots of free resources for people at all levels of technical proficiency uh, for how to make better use of data. Um, we're trying to connect people together and, and match make projects. So come to data.org is your first step. And, and from there, we can point you to, to, to um, great kind of next steps and next partnerships you can form. Great. Well, Daniel, it's always a pleasure uh, to talk to you. Um, I always learn uh, a ton and I congratulate you for the work that you, data.org and many others are doing. Uh, precisely to remind people of this very powerful uh, set of of tools that you know could uh, actually strengthen the capacity of the social sector of the development sector and uh, help us in in a, such an ar array of problems that we're facing from refugee crises to health crises to geopolitical crises and uh, my hope is that we destigmatize a little bit what you know machine learning does and what data science does, uh, and make it more approachable and more accessible uh, to everyone. Um, just to uh, continue with the symposium, it is now my pleasure um, as an alum of Tech de Monterrey to introduce the next Reach case study video. Uh, examining interventions addressing irregular land conditions in Monterrey, Mexico, where my 
family live. So uh, let's run that video and thank you again, Daniel. Thank you so much.